All right, I've given you a handout, and I've done something that I, I've tried to shy away from uh, for lo these many years, and that is the second, um, yeah, they, sorry about that, the, uh, the second excerpt that I gave you is fairly technical. Uh, so it uses, it, it talks about parts of speech, it talks about tenses in Greek and those kind of things. But the reason why I gave it to you is I want to see, I want you to see a scholar grapple with word meaning so that you can understand how different Bible translations translate. Uh, you may ask, well, why does, why does my Bible say this and that Bible say that and the other Bible? And I want you just to see how a, uh, how a scholar who is part of a translation committee wrestles with pretty easy words and yet still trying to come to the exact conclusion. So that's what it is. If, it, if you get confused, just please don't. Don't let, it, don't let it sidetrack you. If you don't want to read it, don't read it. But um, it, it's, uh, they're both about chapter 2, which is where we'll start, and I'll start reading in just a minute. But I just want to throw that out there to you, that as we look at the book of Colossians, and as we look really at any of the New Testament books, you'll see and find them wrestling with trying to get the exact English translation for these Greek, uh, these Greek words. And so that's what you'll see. If you see a word that you can't pronounce in brackets and in italics, that means that it's a Greek word, and don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just, I just want you to, that's a quote from one of the commentaries that I use, and I just really want you to see him grappling with um, the right translation of, of a word. If, if, that doesn't, if, if that doesn't ring your bell, then, uh, then don't worry about it. Just let it, uh, let it remain unrun, unrung. <laughs> but uh, um, if, if you like to see that kind of thing, uh, I, I just want, so I know some of you are interested in that, and I, I wanted you to see it. Um, but there's good stuff in, in the article anyway, or in the excerpt anyway, uh, regardless of whether you read the whole thing or understand it, it's good stuff. So, without further ado, Colossians chapter 2. Let me tell you, let me go back just a quick, quick, uh, uh, quick thing real quick. Paul wrote it, he wrote it while he was imprisoned in Rome, A.D. 61-62. He wrote it to the people in Colossae, and by extension to the people in Laodicea. We'll see that. Colossae and Laodicea were close by. Uh, cities, and so he wanted them to, sh to. He wanted the Laodiceans to also read this. Now, I know Laodicea is a bad word in church circles. When we get to the Book of Revelation, uh, we recognize that we have a church that is lukewarm and is not accomplishing what the Lord uh, had for it. But, uh, but they weren't always like that right? They, they, they weren't founded like that. that. That's something that any church can wrestle with falling into and struggle with. And, uh, and so uh, here, probably predating the revelation uh, of Jesus through John, uh, we have Paul saying, hey, share with the Laodicean church this letter, and then read the one that I sent to them. So they're, they're, they're just a church um, later who's struggling, but... Um, but they're just a church, right? So they're just like you and I, normal people trying to follow Jesus and maybe sidetracked with laziness or sidetracked with wealth or sidetracked with whatever. They're just sidetracked. Um, but here, they're not, they're not in a bad way. Uh, the purpose is to confront the so-called Colossian heresy. And so last week, we looked at uh, the supremacy of Christ in all things. You're going to hear more of that in chapter 2, but I want you to understand that to combat this so-called Colossian heresy is, uh, is to recognize that we have everything that we need in the person of Jesus the Christ. That's really the whole summation of the book of Colossians, is that to combat any heresy, we have everything we need in Jesus. There is nothing that we need that Jesus doesn't provide for us spiritually. There's no reason to get caught up in different kind of mystical things. We don't need new revelations. We don't need new visions. We don't need all that kind of stuff. Jesus is our all and in all. That's, that's the whole summary of the book of Colossians. So now turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. No, I'm just kidding. 
we'll, we're going we're gonna to go through this and still see some other things. But that really is the, the summation of all of this. Uh, this was the outline I showed you. Um, and so we really got through uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, the reconciliation through Christ. Uh, and then we're going to go in against the heresy today. And I, I hope to finish this. this. This really isn't a lot. I'm not going to teach the whole book, but I just want you to get the feeling of the book as we go through the rest of it. That's the outline. Um, by the way, if you weren't here last week, I have this outline on the, on the handout. If you need that handout, stick around right after this, and I will print you some copies and make sure I put one in your hand so that you have everything we need. So don't worry about, don't worry about writing this down furiously. We're going to move on. All right, so uh, we got to the mission statement of Paul last week, which is at the end of Colossians 1, which is we proclaim him admonishing every man, that is Jesus, we proclaim Christ admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter 2. I'm going to read a large-ish section to you because I want you to get the, the grip of it and then, uh, and then we'll walk through and look at a few other things. So here we go, starting in verse number one, Colossians chapter two, God's word says this, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Start right, stop right there. I, I'm just going to go through it. It'll be easier than me going back. Um, so what I want you to see is that he's saying my concern is for the people at Colossae and Laodicea. I want you to have everything that you need in order to walk uh, in this relationship with the Lord. Notice that he says that they haven't seen his face. Uh, this is because he didn't plant these churches. They were planted with the spread of the gospel, but he's concerned for them just as a grandparent would be concerned for a grandchild. He planted a church, probably the church at Ephesus, and, this, and someone went from Ephesus to these two churches and, and carried the gospel, and these two churches sprung up. He feels responsible for them even though he didn't plant them. Notice also that he summarizes in verse 2 and 3 what he's about to do in the rest of this chapter, and that is to say that, you, you'll, uh, that, you'll, that your hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what he's saying is that everything, just what I said earlier, everything that we need is in Christ himself. We don't need other things. And he's getting ready to get into those other things that we don't need, which is the, at, at the heart of this so-called Colossian heresy. And I want you to understand that even in our churches today, whether American churches or you go church overseas, in our churches today, we are constantly being tempted to, to supply extra stuff other than what we have in Christ. They may be rules. They may be traditions. They may be all kinds of other things. And, uh, and I want you to know that Jesus is enough. Now, I'm going to step on some toes just to get you thinking in that way. And I don't mean to. This isn't, this isn't like I'm, a, I'm a, a, you know, after any of you. But I know that some of you may have heard this before. Or maybe some of you have said this before. And that's okay. You can repent and not do it anymore. But I've heard people, lots of people say, I can't worship if the choir's not wearing robes. There's no cross behind the lectern. The organ's not playing. We're not singing hymns. We're not doing, I can't worship. Listen, we don't need that other stuff to worship. What we need is Jesus. 
Jesus is the heart of our worship. He is our all and in all. And by the way, you could, I, I picked on this group because I made a quick assessment judging by the colors of your hair that, that, uh, that those would fit. If I were speaking that way to a younger crowd, I would say, if there's no drum kit or if there's no praise and worship music, if there's no dark lights or painted ceiling, it, we, everybody is tempted to bring in cultural things and to say, I need this in order to worship, or I need this in order to walk right with God. I need it. And the truth is, we don't need that. What we need is Jesus. Now, those other things may be avenues to apprehend Jesus, to lay hold of him in your worship experience, but you don't need those. You need him. Oh, him. And so that's what he's going to say. Pick up in verse 4. We're going to keep reading. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So let me ask you a question. Don't worry about what the, the church at Colossae did. I'll tell you that in a second. But let me ask you, how did you receive Jesus Christ the Lord? By faith. By faith. You heard about him. You were convicted in your spirit by the Holy Spirit. And you, by faith, trusted Christ. If you are saved, it was you are saved by grace through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So what he's saying is, if you've received Jesus by faith, continue to follow him by faith. He says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. The answer is by faith, hearing the word and trusting him. Uh, Miss Cora is teaching a, uh, a Bible study for our ladies at her home, and she is teaching. It's about faith. And the, the question she asked me was, what is, how do you define faith? And my ultimate definition of faith is hearing from God and believing it, and then living your life believing it. So that's faith. You hear, you hear the word, you believe it, and you live by it. What you're going to see is that these people in Colossae were now trying to experience more heightened spiritual whatever experience. They were trying to have, I know I said experience is a verb and then experience is a noun, and that's not, I don't like to do that, but I don't know what else to call it. They were trying to have these spiritual experiences by doing other kinds of things, and that's not what we ought to be looking for. Jesus is our all and in all. So we press into him, we know more about him. We trust him more. We hear his words and trust him. We hear the word of God and trust it. And we align our lives like that. But we don't give way to all kinds of philosophies and other things trying to have more of what Jesus is because Jesus is everything. He's the fullness. This idea of fullness means completion. It means filled up. Everything we need is in Christ. Keep reading. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, that is Jesus, made you alive together with him. 
having forgiven us all our transgressions. How many? All. all. Is that just all the ones you've done in the past or all, the, all of them? Past, present, and future. Having canceled out the certificate of debt, uh, this idea of canceled out uh, is the discussion of that second, that second uh, uh, excerpt that I gave you. Uh, this idea of canceled out is the idea of being blotted out or wiped clean um, and, and, and just taken away. This, this, so having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. So th those are some pretty incredible words. I want to tell you what they mean, and then I want to tell you what they mean in the context that Paul is using them right here. So what they mean is, is that when Jesus died for us, he effectively took the certificate of debt uh, as if it were an IOU. Because of your sin, you owe God something that you couldn't pay. And so that's an IOU. What this says is that Jesus canceled out that IOU. In his death on the cross, he canceled, he wiped it clean. There is no record. If you're in Christ, there is no record of any more sin. It's It's gone. Uh, like, is this thing on? Uh, hello? Uh, you know, I think we hear this so often that we just get numb to it. But I want you to understand what this means. That means every thought and word and deed that you shouldn't have done that you did, and every thought and word and deed that you should have done that you didn't do, all of that, that guilt, but not just the guilt, the record of it, See, what we often think is that Jesus paid for our guilt, but that the record remains. But it, it doesn't. The record itself is gone. It's been wiped clean. And then he uses a different word picture, having been nailed to the cross. And, and, so, and then the next word picture, verse 15 and when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, the idea of this disarmed rulers and authorities is the, uh, the let's, I, I'm not saying exactly this, but I'm going to use another picture of myself. Satan is the accuser. And so what, what he would accuse us of is not lies, not first, not lies, but the truth of our sin. Right? That's what he holds against us is the truth about it. Look at your sin. Look at your sin. That's what he says. When you, when you are struggling in your spiritual life, that's the thing that the enemy says to you. Look at your sin. You're a sinner. You're a disgusting person. How could God love you? How could God use you in any way? How could he do any of this stuff? And so these rulers and principalities are constantly reminding us of our sin, but not just not just them, but even other people will be giving us philosophies and, and things that we have to do to try to absolve us of our sin. Well, we don't need that because in, in the, I forgot who sang it, but, uh, but there was a song 30 years ago called What Sin? Do y'all remember that song? Have y'all heard that? It, it, the, the idea is that we, when we go to the Lord and, and kind of, uh, you know, apologize for our sin, he says to us, what sin? Because it's been taken away. It's, it's, been, it's been removed. And when he had, so when he had disarmed those rulers and authorities, those people who would hold our sin up against us and say that we can't do it, when he had disarmed them, he made a public display of them having triumphed over them through him. This idea of a public display is what would happen when Roman conquerors, it wasn't just Roman conquerors, but in this case I'll use that, any of these, those old world conquerors, when they would take a king or they would take uh, an army and having been defeated and they would parade them through the streets, mocking them and making fun of them because they had no more power. They'd been defeated. 
That's what Jesus did to the principalities and the powers who had something against us. He paraded them publicly. It's done. They have no more power over us. I mean, we are absolutely, completely free. Now, to put this back into the context right here, Paul uses those words not because he just wanted to talk cool about what Jesus did for us, although had he wanted to talk cool about what Jesus did for us, it would have been okay (laughs) because what Jesus did for us was awesome. But what he's saying is we shouldn't then submit ourselves to any other philosophies, to any other uh, ways of doing things because Jesus did it all. There is no other, uh, there, there's no other thing that we have to do. Jesus is enough. Now, I, I don't want to pick, uh, you know me, I, I want to be really, really kind to those who believe differently than, than we do, uh, especially those who claim Christ as Lord, who think differently. But you don't, ha- <laughs> but, but. <laughs> But you don't have to go to a priest to get absolution from your sins. Jesus has taken them away. You don't need that. They're done. Now, let me just, just because I raised this idea of sin and God saying what sin, let let me say this. So when we commit a sin now, and we do, When we commit a sin now, this does not go against our record of our sins. God's not keeping score of your sin. It's been taken away, all of them. That's what it says, all of them. However, when Jim Collier sins, Jim Collier knows it. And so while God's not keeping score, Jim Collier is keeping score. And the only way for Jim Collier to step away from that is to seek forgiveness from God. And so it's it's not about God forgiving me of my sin. That's already forgiven. It's about me confessing my sin to him, acknowledging that it was against him, and seeking his cleansing from it, which he gives because he is faithful and just. And he gives it completely. Does that make sense? So there's no, all of your sin, past, present, and future, when you are in Christ, is, is, is gone. It's, it's away from you. All of it. Because when Jesus paid the price, when he did these things, you hadn't even sinned except in Adam. <laughs> uh, you, you hadn't sinned on your own. It, was, it wasn't until you were born. Thousands of years after Jesus did this. And yet it was still done. Enough. When, when you trusted Christ, it was laid to your account. It was it Actually, it was laid to his account, and it was all gone, wiped clean. Now, that's pretty incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, she, what she said was, if you couldn't hear her, she said that as a young Christian, that was one of the things that she was really overcome by because it's hard to believe, though it's really true. Absolutely. By the way, this is why I'm going at the pace I'm going through the book of Colossians. It is a short book, but man, it's dense um, about who Jesus is and what he's done on our behalf. Uh, if y'all remember, if some of you weren't here, but if you remember, it's, it's the first New Testament book I preached when I got here. It's because it makes such, um, s- such beauty of Jesus and what he did. Uh, and and it, I mean, it's just, it's filled up with the supremacy of Christ and what he's done on our behalf. Yeah, it, it is, it's overwhelming to think that it's done. He's been, it's wiped away. By the way, that, that wiping away is the same picture, same word, you'll see this later, but same word that is used in Revelation when it says that God wipes away our tears. And, and you know that there's not going to be any more tears once God wipes them away, right? It, it's done. And so here, he wipes away our sin debt, the, the record of our sins, which means that it's done, it's wiped away. There's not any more record of our sins. Start in verse 16. Therefore, because of all that I just read to you, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. 
things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Old Testament regulations, and, and there are even New Testament people or people living today who are trying to implement things either straight from the Old Testament or they make up new ones. He's, he's really encompassing all of those by saying uh, Sabbath, new moon, festival, food or drink. But as we read that, what I want you to see is there, the Old Testament regulations were, were shadows pointing to Jesus. They were... They were uh, they weren't fulfillments. They weren't the completion of the thing. They were the, they were the pre preparation for the thing. They were preparing people to think about holiness and to think about sin and to think about God, um, God being able to speak all things and to control all things and that he is Lord of all. And so when Jesus arrived, who is the substance of these things, he is the the reality. He is the fullness of it. That's what all this is. That's why the word fullness, fullness, fullness. He is the fullness of all of the promises of the Old Testament. When Jesus arrived, all those other things were done away with. Why would we go back to the shadows when we have the true light? Why would we go back to those things that are, that are just preparing us when we already have what we have in Christ? So we don't, so we don't have to, like I don't, I don't have to tell you not to eat pork or not to eat uh, shrimp or not to eat catfish, uh, which I love all of those things. That's why I picked them. We don't have to worry about those things, not because we're not Jewish, but because Christ has fulfilled them. He's, it's, it's done. We have everything we have in Christ. So we don't have to follow those anymore. We don't have to keep certain days, certain holidays. We don't... <laughs> This is, this is not, I want to be really careful. I know that this may be part of your tradition, and I'm not trying to joke or mess with your tradition. Uh, if you want to do it, you can do it. But it's why I don't celebrate Ash Wednesday yesterday. It's why I don't celebrate Lent. I don't need that. I have complete absolution in Christ. I have complete everything that I need in Christ. I don't need a special day or, or to, to talk about my sin or a special season of time to give up something to prove that I've repented. The, the proof of my repentance is Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's, it's the Holy Spirit who lives in me. Now, if, if that's your tradition, if you, if you do those things, that's awesome as long as you recognize that you're doing them don't make you any, <laughs> doesn't make you any closer to Jesus. Jesus is everything that you need. Now, it may put you in a mindset. There are certain things that certainly put us in a mindset to worship Christ, and we ought to exercise those, but we can't let those things become the thing. Those things ought to be just pathways. So if your pathway to, to being close with Christ is to wake up at 5 o'clock every morning and spend an hour and a half in Scripture and pray uh, in that time, then go for it. But don't think your righteousness is wrapped up in that hour and a half in Scripture. Your righteousness is wrapped up in Christ. Does that make sense? So, and we all have this. We all have things that we begin to, if, especially if you have a personality like mine, which is really uh, regimented and, and does the same thing every, every cycle. Every day I've got to do these things, and every week I've got to do it this way. And that's just the way I am. I'm a little obsessive. <laughs> compulsive when it comes to some of that stuff. But it's just the way that I process. But I've got to recognize that it's not my routine that makes me right with God. It's Jesus. And I believe sometimes that the Lord scrambles my routine to remind me that it's Jesus and not my routine. So I throw all that out there. Uh, everybody's got their own thing. Um, some people like to have praise and worship music playing in the in the sanctuary when they walk in. Some people like it silent. Some people like the organ playing a prelude. Well, we can't do it all, right? I mean, everybody can't get it their way, but we don't need that. It may be nice to have it, but we don't need that in order to be right with God and worship him. What we need is faith in Jesus. Does this make sense? Everybody good with it? All right, good, good. I'm going I'm to press on. 
So that leads me to this. Uh, Jesus' triumph on our behalf, I just talked to, that, talked to you about that, verses 13 to 15. Verses 20 to 23, what I just read, is our freedom from man-made rules. We don't need to follow man-made rules. You may ask me, Pastor Jim, what's the best way for me to get close to Christ? And I may tell you some things, but you need to know that doing them my way isn't ultimately going to make you right with God. Ultimately, faith in Christ. And I can only tell you how I exercise my faith in Christ, but you may do it in a different way. It may, it may not be in the morning that you spend time in God's Word. It may be in the evening that you do. Maybe that you have to listen to it uh, because of eyesight or because of uh, your attention span or whatever. It may be easier for you to listen to God's Word instead of read it. Whatever the thing is, you shouldn't do it my way. You should do it in a way that brings you into a relationship with Christ, that, that maintains that, that walking with him. Uh, it, it's not it's so easy for us to say, we got to do it this way. We got to, you know, here's, here's 10. It's why I don't preach, by the way, seven keys to successful living or, or uh, four, four ways to, because you don't need that. What you need is a picture of Jesus and you need to draw into him um, the best you can as you walk with him. All right, verses 1 to 4. He goes on, by the way, and just, and just talks about uh, the, if, if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, this is verse 20 of chapter 2, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. So these things that we do, these rules, and he's really talking about some ascetic rules, um, almost like monastery rules, monk rules, don't touch these things, don't handle these things, don't taste these things, don't go to movie theaters, don't play with cards, you know, don't, don't chew tobacco or whatever, you know, all these things that we say don't do. Now, by the way, I do believe that chewing and smoking tobacco is bad for you, all right? I, and as such, if you continue to abuse your body in such ways, it, it could become sin. But I don't think taking a leaf of tobacco and putting it in your mouth and chewing it on it is sin, right? I, I think there's a difference between, between knowing that you're abusing your body and, and, and the thing itself. Does that make sense? So we do that all the time. Don't do this. Don't eat that stuff. It's bad to, you know, it's bad to eat butter or it's bad to eat margarine or it's bad to eat country crock. Well, that's not sin. Country crock's just bad. <laughs> but I mean, it's butter's good. Yeah, butter's good. <laughs> Grass-fed Irish butter or whatever, you know. I, who knows? I don't, I, I, don't believe, I don't pretend to know all that stuff. And by the way, the best we know about all that stuff is just man's knowledge, right? I mean, if you've followed coffee as long as I've been alive, you know it was good, then bad, then good, then bad, then good, then bad. And who knows? What most people drink and call coffee today is just sugar milk, with whipped cream. <laughs> yeah. and, and so I'm not sure that even accounts for coffee. But I just say all of this to say that, that the thing itself is not, it, let me say it in Jesus' words, it's not what goes into the body that defiles a person, but what comes out. So it's the heart, it's, the, it's, it's what you're doing on purpose to do it. Now, if you're a slave to tobacco or caffeine or something, you're in a bad spot. You ought not to be a slave to anything except to Christ. So I just show this to say that we have lots of rules that we, that we put up and say, if you do this, 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 and this, you'll be okay. But that's not true. The only way you're okay is to be in a faith relationship with Jesus, to follow him as your all and in all. Does this make sense? Now, I'm not saying go out there and live like a heathen either, because you can't be enslaved to Christ and live like a heathen. So anyway, I, I, I digress here. Um, I, it reminded me of, a, of an old story I heard um, Charles Spurgeon, the great Baptist preacher from England, 
had what we would consider a bad habit. He smoked cigars. He smoked cigars. And he, uh, he uh, preached, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And somebody confronted him about smoking that cigar one time, and he lit it up and took a drag on it and said, I enjoy this to the glory of God. <laughs> and so I'm not suggesting that that's your thing or you go do that, and I'm certainly not suggesting you look for a bad habit to engage in, but I'm just saying that we live unto the Lord, and a lot of the things that we view as wrong are really just man-made. Now, they may be extensions from Scripture, and, but, but lots of this is, is just our culture saying this is wrong and we ought not to do it, and yet cultures change and rules change. God's Word never changes, never changes. All right. I digressed just a little. Go to chapter 3. I want to show you our resurrected life. Recognize that what Paul is holding up, uh, he said it in 2, in, in verse 2 and verse 12, having been buried with him in baz baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God. So this is a very foundational thought to Paul. Not, it's not just that we have exercised faith in Jesus and what he did. That is true. But in the reality, in the, in the real spiritual realm, in God's eyes, let's say, when we put our faith in Jesus, what we did was we died to an old way of life and we were raised to a new life. Does this sound familiar? This is our pronunciation when we baptize folks. We are saying, and that's the symbol of this baptism, is that they've died to an old way of life, and they've been raised to newness of life, or to a new life. That, that quote, by the way, is from Romans chapter 6. But he says the exact same thing. It's the way that Paul envisioned, and by the way, by the extension, of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he envisioned it. <clears throat> that's the way he envisioned the Christian life. So if you belong to Jesus, you have died in a very real sense to the old life, and you have been raised to a new life. You are now alive in Christ. And, and it's that life that, that allows you to have eternal life. It's that life that is eternal life, and it's that life that is going to live on into the resurrection uh, and it'll be in that life that your body, though dead, will be raised because of that new life, right? So, so we are experiencing a part of the resurrection right now because we are alive in Christ. That resurrection will be in its fullness when our bodies come up out of the ground. Does that make sense? All right, so, so that's the real life that we're living. It's not flesh and blood, but it's this resurrected life in Christ. So in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, and you have if you put your faith in him, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God." When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. That's what I just told you about the resurrection. It's, it's true now, but when he comes, the fullness of it will be revealed because we'll have this new life in Christ. You say, what does that mean? It means we are no longer slaves or we are no longer having to live this life on this earthly plane, which includes rules and traditions and days and diets and all that kind of stuff. We keep our mind focused on Christ, which means that we have already been raised. We are no longer worried about those things that I just mentioned. We're now living this life in Christ. So eat to the glory of God. And drink to the glory of God. And I'm not going to say smoke to the glory of God. But live your life to the glory of God, recognizing that 
we are already seated in the heavenlies with Jesus. That's what Ephesians says in a, in a very uh, spiritual and mystical way. We have already attained the resurrection because Jesus has. And we're with him. Our whole, he is everything to us, and so we don't need the rest. Now, it does mean that we live a life that is pleasing to him, but that's not a life of rules, but a life of faith, although that life of faith manufactures a life that looks like a life of rules. Does that make sense? We're, it's no longer me looking at a rule book saying, okay, I can do this, I can't do that, I can do this, I can't do that. It means that I'm looking at Jesus and I'm following him, and he's living by this. And so wherever he goes, I'm going. Whatever he's doing, I'm doing. But I'm, not, I'm no longer pressed in by the rules that religions or philosophies or traditions have on us. Does that make sense? Let me sum it up this way. You are free in Jesus. You are free. You are free. Notice it did say earlier, let no man judge you. Therefore, we live unto Christ. My call for you is to live unto Christ. Now, there are some things that, that are, are handrails for us that, that we know we're not living for Christ if we bump into those handrails, but there's a lot of things that are well within the scope of pleasing the Lord and just, and just walking with Him. It, it really is freedom. Therefore, he goes on, in verses 5 and to 14, talking about what to take off and what to put on. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Because we're alive in Christ, we're dead to all that stuff. It shouldn't hold on to us anymore. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, Malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful." So he says, put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, lying, evil practices, and put on the new stuff, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Notice what he does here. He's not holding these up as rules to live by. He's holding them up as clothes to put on. Because what he says is, in your own being in Christ, you are already right. You're, you're complete in Christ. So clothe yourselves, not with evil practices, but clothe yourselves, this, this, this already completed self, clothe yourself with the things that are good, compassion, humility, kindness, patience, all of these things. Does that make sense? He changes, uh, so it, it's easy to read this and think, well, he just gave us a bunch more rules, but that's not what he did. He says you can never be complete by rules. You actually have a new life. You're a new person. So therefore, you ought to wear new clothes. You put off the old clothes, and you put on the new clothes, and that's how you live. Does that make sense? All right, very good. Let's keep going. In uh, verses 15 to 17, he talks about the effect of peace in our hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. This is the way that we should live, the, the, the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. Now, what this means is we are no longer shaken or in conflict by sin 
or by reminders of sin or by rules or by other things. The peace of Christ means that we recognize that we are right with him and we have peace. And this peace rules us. It, it steadies our life. It, it commands who we are because we have peace with Christ. How do you maintain this peace? How do you get this peace? Well, if you read on, he says that it's the word of Christ that dwells within you. I believe that this is a synonym in a different way, but it, it, no, let me say it differently. It's synonymous. It's not a synonym. It's synonymous with being spirit-filled in Ephesians. In Ephesians, it was walk in the Spirit, be filled. Here it says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. I believe that the way that the Word of Christ dwells in you is for the Holy Spirit to dwell in you. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit who's going to bring to remembrance all the things that Jesus said. And so this is a practice of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Now, absolutely, you need to read the Word of God in order to allow the Holy Spirit something to work with right? That's his tool on you. As the Holy Spirit works in you, he uses a tool. That tool is the scripture. So we let the scripture come into our life. But I believe that this right here is speaking about the Holy Spirit who is mediating that word in us and ruling us. It's him because he, the reason why I say that is in verse 16, he uses exactly the same verbiage that he does in Ephesians chapter four, talking about how we're to communicate with one another. How is that? With wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. So our communication when the Holy Spirit, you know, we often say, how do you know the Holy Spirit is work at work in your life? Well, we say he's manufacturing the fruit of the Spirit. All right, so we say that. But I also want you to see that the, the, the other sign that you are surrendered to the Holy Spirit is that we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, giving thanks to God. So the way that we know that we are being used by the Spirit as we communicate to one another is we communicate in things that are pleasing to the Lord, that bring worship to God, and that give thanks to God, which means that we ought not to be nearly as Eeyore-ish as some of us can be. Oh, is me. <laughs> A little rain cloud over us. Oh, poo. <laughs> we ought not to be like that, but we ought to be like Tigger. Ooh, hoo, hoo. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Cheer up, donkey boy. And uh, so we see that, uh, and we ought to be Tigger in Christ. Lord, thank you for all that you've given us. Thank you for this new life. Thank you for using the, the things in, in, around us, bad or good, to shape me into the image of Christ. Thank you that everything that happens to me is, is for my good and your glory. Thank you for doing this work in for me. That's how we know that we are surrendered to the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not a rule. It's not like you ought not to talk ugly about, or you ought not to complain all the time. It's not like that. It's like if the Holy Spirit is alive in you, you won't complain all the time. He'll be manufacturing thanksgiving. So it means, it doesn't mean that he's not in you. I didn't mean to say it like that. What I meant to say is he's not in control of you. And so the way to stop complaining is not just to go, oh, I'm going to grit my teeth and stop complaining. The way to stop complaining is to cede your rule of your life over to the peace of Christ mediated through the Holy Spirit and let him have his way and he will manufacture thanksgiving in your life. That's the picture of this resurrected life. He goes on to talk about family relations, verses 18 and following, um, wives, husbands, children, fathers. Uh, I went in some depth in Ephesians with that. I'm not going to do it again. He, he really says some of those same things. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. 
Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of, your inher- or of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. I believe that that last portion, slaves and masters, although is speaking really of slaves and masters in the scripture, I believe that the way that we apply it now is employers, employees, and those relationships like that. Even maybe um, uh, leadership roles within the church and uh, and and leading and 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 following in the church as well. Although that may be pressing it a little bit beyond what Paul meant it to be. It's just a, a way of application is why I bring that up, not necessarily exactly what it means. Any questions about those? All right, I've got 15 minutes. I'm going to do this thing. Whatever you do, do all for the glory of the Lord. And then verses 2 to 6, he talks about walking in wisdom. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it, that is keeping alert in prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Notice that what Paul prays for, by the way, he says that their prayers make them participants in his ministry. That's the first thing I want you to see. So uh, I know there are many of you who do this, uh, maybe all of you, but I thank you for praying for me that, that because you are truly participants in my ministry when you pray for me. In fact, I believe that it is the prayer of the people that makes for successful ministry, not the power of the preacher or not the, not the skill of the preacher. It really is the people praying. Paul says that right here. Second thing I want you to see is that Paul is, is using a, another image here. Uh, where is Paul right now while he's writing? In prison. Notice what he asks them to pray for him. Verse 3. How does he say chances? An open door. He, I believe, um, you're right. That's a, you're exactly right. But I'm just showing you what he's saying is pray that God would open a spiritual door so that the word that I preach will make an effect to those who come. And I think he's also saying pray that the door of the prison will be open. I think both of those are in his mind. But he recognizes that the prison door doesn't have to be open in order for him, the word of, of Christ to go forth. Because remember, as we read in Romans, that, that, that there is a whole guard there that he's staying with that are coming to know Christ because he's in prison. So I, I believe this is a double-edged prayer that he's asking them to pray. I think he has both in mind. Pray that I get out of here, but also pray that even if I don't get out of here, that the word has a way to get out of here, that, that it's, it's not imprisoned as well. Uh, and so... Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, verses 5 and 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. All right, so three things he says as far as walking in wisdom. First, pray. Pray. That's verses uh, 2 through 4. Pray. Because remember, he starts in verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer with thanksgiving. And then he adds on to that, pray for us also. So pray, number two, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. Those outsiders are those outside the church. Those are lost people. So that means that um, that as we live in front of other people, we ought to walk in wisdom. And and so we, we... live with ourselves in a way that won't be stumbling blocks to those who are on the outside. We walk in wisdom. And then third, let the things that we say be seasoned with grace. Let our words be gracious words. Let's not be condemning. Let's be, let's be careful what we say, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now, I want to say something, and this may be outside of, I may go to preaching here, and I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to give you an example, but if the shoe fits, as they say, strap that puppy on, right, or or wear it. 
I notice that there are a lot of Christian people who in social media, whether it's Twitter or whatever it's called now, X, formerly known as Twitter, or, um, or on Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or just on emails or whatever on the website, I notice that there are a lot of Christians who really, really like to speak ill of other people. Right? Even other, uh, even other people who maybe deserve it, except that's not who we ought to be as Christians. According to this, we ought to season our speech with salt, with grace. We ought to speak grace to people. We ought to give them a chance to see Christ and respond. Uh, it's why I try very carefully not to criticize by name lost people. Because I think that criticizing by name lost people is not good for us or for them. Now, I speak about the things that they do. I mean, if a politician's a liar, he's a liar, right? So we ought to say, stay away from lies. But there's, there's no sense in me calling the name of your most hated politician, because that's what you already think. You don't need to hate them. You need to pray for them. Pray for all those who are in authority over us. And so whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump, and I will say this, it is, and, and you can quote me on this, it is a demonstration of the judgment of God that of all the people that live in America, those are the two that we have a choice between. That is a demonstration of the judgment of God. However, that's, that's the most that I'll say and, and pin it to them. Because we ought to pray for either of them when they're in power. We ought, to, we ought to pray that the Lord will bring their open their eyes to their wicked ways and would call them to repentance, whomever it is. And by the way, this isn't the first election that we've just had two deadbeats to choose from. Did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. How can I speak grace into it? Uh, <laughs> I just want you to see I struggle with this too. <laughs> but it's why I try to avoid talking specifically about this because it doesn't really do any good. It doesn't do any good. What does good is us to invest in them in prayer and to speak, speak speech to one another, speak grace to one another in our speech is what I mean. And so um, let it always be seasoned with salt. This is a really difficult thing for us, especially because we are an angry culture. And as as Christians, part of this angry culture, we have somehow thought that it's up to us to be angry too. Now, I've heard Christians in the past have confronted me on this idea of anger and say, we ought to be, anger, we ought to be angry against sin. Absolutely. But we ought to do it without sin. We ought to be angry without sin. And we ought to hunger and thirst in righteousness or for righteousness as much with our guy as we do with their guy. And I don't know who your guy is I'm, or lady. I'm just saying that most people, even Christians that I see, are so angry against the other party, which, by the way, just looks like the rest of the world. It doesn't, there's nothing Christian about that. It just looks like the rest of the world. We ought to be as disciplined in our thirst and hunger for righteousness in our own party or in our own church or in our own family as we are in somebody else's church or in somebody else's family or in somebody else's party. Because if you really are going to hunger and thirst for righteousness, it, as Peter writes, judgment begins in the household of the Lord. It begins with us, not with them. It starts here. And so I just throw all that out there. This is the end of his, his how to live this resurrected life for us. He then finishes, oh, I guess he just finishes. He finishes by wrapping things up uh, and, and talks about lots and lots. He gives really a hat tip to all these co-workers that he has. Uh, verse 7 talks about Tychicus, our beloved 
brother and faithful servant. He'll bring you the information. He's the mailman. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. And with Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Remember Onesimus. We'll get back to him in a little while. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas's cousin Mark, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. You know who this guy is? He's John Mark. What happened with John Mark and Paul? They split up. They didn't like each other. They had a fight. Now Paul is saying, when he comes, welcome him. He's good for you. I've already told you about him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be all encouragement to me. So those are the Jewish people who are on Paul's side. And then he picks up with Epaphras. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfectly and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he is a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, a beloved, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and you for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in, it, in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. And that's the book of Colossians. Isn't that cool that he named all those people? It's interesting. One of the saddest parts, and I preached this when I was here, is Demas. Demas. Here he says Demas is one of, one of our number. Demas is, is good. Uh, for us. And then later in the, in the uh, pastoral epistles, he says, and Demas, who loved this world more than Christ, and he left, he left out. So we see someone, even in the act of walking away from the gospel um, and the ministry. So anyway, this is the book of Colossians. I love it. It is a fantastic book. Are there any questions before I let you go? All right. Was this encouraging to you today? Yes. All right. Is it still what you signed up for? Yes. Am I skipping anything that I need to skip or am I going too in deep for things that you want? Is it just right? Yes. All right. It's just right. All right. Next week uh, is Young Hearts. We will not meet this time. It's Young Hearts. That's the 22nd. We will meet back again on the 29th of February. Uh, and uh, yes, this, this year has a 29th. And we will meet back here two weeks from today, and we will pick up with the book of 1 Thessalonians. So with that, y'all have a great day. God bless you, and I will see you soon.